Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and brightest in the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Folks, I have an amazing guest today, Lori Ruderman. She is an all-around badass HR pro and author of her new book, Betting on You. We're going to dig into that in a moment. I'm thrilled to welcome her today. Lori, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Likewise, and it's been a long time in the making. I've been a tremendous fan of you, your content, and your story, and I'm really excited to share that with everyone on the podcast today. So before we dig into all the fun stuff and all the uh, hopefully really insightful questions that I try to ask my guests, tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us, as I say when I talk to candidates, tell us who you are and what you do best. Well, who I am and what I do best has nothing to do with work, which may be how <laughs> I got here in the first place. But Love it. I am a former human resources leader turned writer, speaker, and entrepreneur. I used to work for some big companies you may have heard of, like Pfizer. They're in the news for, you know, random reasons. And I've worked in insurance, retail, manufacturing. But I am most known for speaking truth to power and bringing a contrarian view to the world of work. I love it. And I really think, and we'll dig into that contrarian view, because I think that contrarian view is really becoming you know, more popular and understood these days. And I think that's what's driving the needle forward. In most cases, we'll get to that in a moment, but let's let's hit that big rewind button. Let's hit, hit that rewind button on that VHS beta tape recorder that we have here. And let's walk it back to the early days. Why HR, right? Like I always like to ask, and, and, and how did you jump from college? Like, were you a quote unquote people person? I mean, what moved you into this world when you were coming out of university? Sure. Back in 1995, when Bill Clinton was president and everybody was watching Friends, I was a junior at a school in St. Louis and had a burgeoning amount of student loan debt and saw that and realized I could not afford to go to graduate school. So I went to the alumni department and the student services department and asked, what do you know? Where can I go work? And they said, well, there's this internship at a candy company. It pays about eight bucks an hour, and it's in the HR department. And I asked, what's HR? And they said, we're not really sure, but you're about to find out. (laughs) So I took that job and learned that I had a real affinity for human stories, drama, and it could be because I was studying literature and theology and all the great stories in the world. But I connected with people, although right from the bat, I was no good getting along with my HR colleagues. They didn't like how I looked, didn't like how I dressed, and they made fun of me and said, who do you think you are, punk rock HR? And I took that and I filed it away. Yeah, yeah. So that's my origin story on how I got here. Truly a happenstance career. I love it. And and do you think it was that first you know, that those first couple of roles where you were getting that pushback, where people were telling you what to wear, what not to wear, what you were doing right and wrong, where it really reinforced this contrarian view that you, you know, carry throughout your career in life? Well, I'd always had a bit of a counterculture thread. You know, some people are raised on like Sesame Street and Baby Einstein. I was raised on The Who, Pink Floyd, and Led Zeppelin. My parents were hippies. I like you. And they only found work because they had to. And so I watched that struggle from a really early age of people who didn't think their work was tied to their worth, but got a lot of messages about their worth through their jobs and really didn't feel good about themselves. So my dad worked at the phone company. My mom fell into a job as a police officer. Interesting. Yeah, but they never were really happy with what they did. And so I had gone to college, the first person in my family to do so, to go to university, to graduate. And I thought, I'm going to do it differently. And it turns out that I did it just like them, only with a mountain of student debt. And while 
I liked the work for the most part in HR. I didn't like the disingenuous messages that I had to tell people. And so after a while, that started grating on me. And I had a very cliche breakdown at an airport. And I thought, I need to do this differently. Question. How did... How did you know that your parents weren't happy with their jobs? Was it was it something they verbalized? Was it a sense? Was it a field? Was it a very like open home where they talked about it? It was all of the above. So they really felt like they were selling out. Even though they mm. had no money, even though they had no means, they didn't have, you know, side hustles that they were pursuing. This act of work seemed somehow beneath them. They felt like they should be doing something else, although they never did the work to figure out what that other thing was. So that was a really early lesson for me. And if there is something else calling you to pursue it, but they also didn't get along with people who worked around them because they felt that this hierarchy that they had to report into somehow was stupid and facetious. And it was, but again, they had no other alternative. And the more that they got enmeshed in the world of work, they liked buying things. They just didn't like what they had to do to buy those things. So an early lesson on consumerism as well. That's that's interesting. And and you said that your parents were hippies. And what was that like with your mom, like working for the man in the establishment as a police officer? It sounds crazy. It is crazy. And she's retired now and she reflects on it. And she's like, it was crazy. She was a Chicago cop and worked wow. nights and did it because she had all these kids. She had four children and wanted a job with health insurance and a pension, which yeah. became really important when my parents split. And so she took the introductory police department exam and scored 100. It was wow. weird. So very smart, very bright woman, only had a GED. And at that time, you could still be a police officer with that, no college. And went in and really excelled academically in the police academy. But it was definitely difficult for her physically and cognitively because the way she saw the world was different than the way they were training her to see it. Well, I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, I didn't even plan on going too deep into this, but mm -hmm. you know, how did that how did that affect your mom like on on the job? Like, was she known in a community, you know, as someone that you know the, that the the local people in the neighborhood trusted because she handled things differently? Maybe she had a different approach. How did that affect her on the job? She had what I would describe as Stockholm syndrome. So she went in and quickly realized that I have all of these counterculture beliefs that if I want to thrive and I want a career, I need to put them aside mm. and thrive. And so what she was really good at was mediating internal conflict, which is something I'm good at in the world of HR, right? So she could see a political landscape and try to figure out how to make stuff work. So she quickly became known as a problem solver. She was excellent with paperwork. She was excellent at busting through bureaucracy and could find solutions when multiple constituencies internally were fighting. And so that really aided and abetted her career. And she was a beat cop. She went out in the evenings and did that job. And what I know about her is that she was okay. She took her baton the first couple of times out. And instead of like restraining people or hitting them with the baton, like you do, I guess. She Back spanked, in that day. Yeah, she spanked them. Like she had a wooden spoon in her hand. <laughs> it was just reflex to spank them like a parent. So that's the hermeneutic she brought to that job. And that and that's so fascinating too, and how that how that translates into your approach in HR. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. so now we're talking the early days of Lori. And one of the yeah. things that jumped out at me on your what you have on LinkedIn here when you're talking about Pfizer, I think it says, quote, I was not very good at this job. <laughs> so the first question is, well, not even a question. I mean, I love that you have that on there, but yeah. what were what weren't you good at? What specifically? Yeah, I was good at um, traveling around the world, laying people off. And it's interesting because all being these, a henchwoman. Yeah, being a henchwoman. All yeah. these people that I've connected with over the years at Pfizer still read my work, even if I've fired them. They still support my writing. They're amazing individuals. I am perfectly built to deliver bad news. I'm five feet tall. I'm blonde. Nobody can get mad at me, right? What I was not good at was tolerating mediocrity within HR. Let's dig right? into that a little bit. Yeah. So it's very, very complacent where, I mean, let's also rewind to about, you know, I'm going to call it 15 years just to throw a number out there. Yeah. HR has always been viewed as a back office operational kind of the the narc, like the bad cop of, yeah. of the office, the hiring and firing, right? Not right. where they are today where your know, organizations are transitioning into true, you know, people leaders and all that kind of stuff. So well, we are optimistic about today, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I've seen, I've seen a lot of good stuff. I mean, the bad stuff is still there, a lot of the legacy, but, but going back then, you know, was it a place where, you know, mediocre people could hide in mediocre companies? 
doing yeah, mediocre work. For sure. And I think it still is today. You know, we often talk about how the best HR professionals come from outside the profession. So that's a discussion to have, right? And then we also talk about how HR should be, you know, coaches and advisors. But at the core of even the highest functioning HR department, there is one job, and that is to mitigate the risk of employee lawsuits. That's right. they're, it. Pro they're protecting they're protecting the the throne. Totally, even in the right. best HR departments today. So back then, what that meant is that everybody was focused on compliance, and there were only opportunities for there to be one or two really star-driven HR performers on a team. And if you were one of those, you were almost like a queen bee. You held that role tight. I'm the VP, and if you want this job, you got to knock me off of it instead of a more collaborative, inclusive environment. And I don't thrive that way. That's not the kind of environment I want to work in. But again, I was so money-driven, status-driven, really focused on paying off my student debt and acquiring more. I was early in starting my life and my family. I wanted the nice house, the nice car, all of that. Right, that of um, I made choices that were actually you know, counterintuitive to what I should have been deciding at that time. It's so interesting you talk about that. You know, before I got into recruiting, the 15 years I worked on the agency side, I worked in corporate America too. I felt the same way too. I've always felt like I didn't fit in because I never wanted to play that political game. I never wanted to climb the ladder. And in the agency world and corporate world, you know, you have to kiss ass and I just couldn't do it. That wasn't, you know, that that wasn't me. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, I mean, aside from, you know, the five years I was in America and, uh, at Sirius XM, most of my other jobs were like one and a half to two years because I got to a point where I was like, I just, that's not me. And I couldn't be truthful and real to myself. Yeah, that's fair. And, uh, you know, I think there's something to be said in listening to that and really respecting it. But there's also something to be said in looking at the system and going, why? But the more I asked why, the more I was unwelcome among my peers. And so I back. really found this tension in my life that was resulting in not taking care of my well-being. I wasn't learning and growing. I wasn't taking really good risks. I was risking all kinds of stuff, mm. but not in a healthy way. So I needed to really be individually accountable for my life, for my career. And I just found it untenable to stay. And it is not the fault of Pfizer. It's not the fault of Monsanto or Kemper, mm -hmm. or any of these beautiful companies I worked for. It was me. I just could not thrive in those systems. So now my best work is outside the system trying to influence change. I, I love it. So let's talk about that decision. Take us back to when you're like, I'm I'm done. I'm done with corporate America. I'm going to chart on my own path. I have so much more to give and do in this world. Yeah. You know, funny enough, I had been blogging in the early days of blogging. Like that was a Remember thing. blogs? Yeah. I know. I know. It was weird. But I had this ex-boyfriend who's like, I started a blog back in like 2004. And I'm like, well, if that idiot can do it. I can do it. And I started writing. <laughs> I say that about podcasting, right? That's right. That's right. I started writing about my job and my life and all these things I should have been fired for writing about, but I was putting it out on the internet anonymously and my traffic was growing. And so at one point I had this breakdown, very cliche in an airport late at night in between flights. I was drinking Pepsi, eating Starburst, not taking care of myself. Yeah. You know, the business uh, choice, right? My, th my thing was M&Ms. Peanut M&Ms for me were a meal when I was on the road. I would love them and I would feel like crap for like the next eight hours. Like eating the king size shareable bags? Oh God, yeah. Why? They're not shareable. They're no, they're shareable for me. <laughs> yeah, right. my mouth but, shares with my belly. Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that was my that was my moment at the airport. I was flipping through an Us Weekly because God forbid I learn anything new, right? I just wanted brainless entertainment, and I thought there's got to be another way. And I went down that path. I write about it in the first chapter of my book, and I'm like, I need to reboot everything now. Did I need to reboot everything? Probably not. But that was my answer to it. And I went through the path of taking care of my well-being and really reinvesting in my health. I really reinvested in learning something new. And I learned how to take risks. But it's not like I decided at this moment I was going to quit and I quit. I kept that job. You know why? Because I had financial obligations. And I saved. And I you know, really put out a business plan that I wanted to follow. And when I felt comfortable, I did this thing that I teach I asked for severance and I teach that in the book and I teach that in my coaching practice. I asked Pfizer to let me go. And you know what they said? Gladly. <laughs> so I had my seed capital for the next big venture Smart. in my life, which is this, the past 10 years. So I really feel like um, people out there make rash decisions and you've got to get some distance between that impulse and action and really work on a plan. And that's what yes. I did.
So, so let's unpack that a little bit because I want to get some actionable advice to folks because yeah. I think there's a lot of people, me myself included, many times in my career, when you get to this point where it's a mix of emotional, rational, and you're like, I don't like it here. This sucks. I don't like my boss. What am I doing? All those questions that you ask yourself yeah. that keep you up in the middle of the night there too. And most people will, will, will have this rage and they're going to wake up. I'm walking in the morning and I'm quitting and that's it. And then their spouse, their partner, their mom, their dad, their trusted advisor, whatever is like, well, time out for a moment. Right. Let's let's think about this. What are we what are we really doing here? What are you going to do next? What do you got planned? How the heck are you going to pay for X, Y, and Z? So, what advice do you give in, in the book to the thought process, the decision, and the steps to be made? Yeah, I have three things that I recommend. First, is I tell people, feelings are not facts, and that's really important to remember. Just because you feel something doesn't mean it's true. Amen. Second thing is that if you want to do something big, you practice in the small moments to get good in the big moments. So you don't walk into that CEO's office and tell him take this job and shove it. In fact, you get local and you figure out the things that are irritating you in your daily life, the small things, and you practice setting boundaries, addressing conflict, resolving things that are unfavorable. You practice in the small moments to nail it in the big moments so that when you are ready to launch into your next career, you've got some practice with all of this. I think the third thing I teach in the book, which is really important, is this idea of a pre-mortem. It's an exercise done by big organizations like NASA, Cisco, IBM, before they do anything big, they do an old stoic exercise where they negatively project into the future for a limited time, how is this going to fail? And the pre-mortem, you do it for a minute. If you're about to go on a job interview, you ask yourself, how is this going to fail? And you know how you're going to fail at a job interview. You're going to be too sweaty. You're going to talk too much. You're going to make terrible eye contact. You set a timer for a minute and you list the silly and the realistic. You, when the timer goes up, you look at that list Just and you get it out. your shit. And if you do this, you give yourself a competitive advantage. Your chance of success jumps by over 30%. So before I left Pfizer, I did the pre-mortem and I'm like, what, what's going to go wrong? I can go homeless. My husband's going to leave me. I might not be able to make the mortgage payment. Some of these things may be real. They may not be real, but that exercise set me up for success moving forward. Wow. Thank you for that soundbite. First and foremost, that was a ton of value add information there. And I think it's really important for everyone to rewind this podcast, rewind this live show and really listen to that separation of being emotional and rational, being able to take that second to breathe and really think about the decisions that you're making. This. So let's fast forward. And I want to talk about punk rock HR. I want to talk about the podcast. How is this different? How is your approach? You know, there's a lot of talking heads out there, myself included. There's a lot of people that think they are the gurus of HR, that people first, people over this, people, 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 people are your organization. What's what's your stance and your approach? Well, you know, I don't think they hold a candle to me. Come on now. That's why I'm here. That's what I do what I do. I think there are all sorts of people out there trying to make a name for themselves around putting people first, you know, leveraging HR technology. But at the end of the day, the numbers don't lie. People are unhappy, they're miserable. And the first sign that the economy improves is going to be a nightmare for HR and talent acquisition departments because they're gonna see a big shift in the workforce. But what's going to happen is people are gonna trade one terrible job for another terrible job and nobody's getting to the root cause of what's wrong with the world of work. And that's where my work comes in. Really trying to tell people before you jump, make sure you know why you're jumping and make sure you know what you're jumping to. Otherwise you're gonna suffer from something called a rival fallacy. Oh yeah. You go up and you ask yourself, is that all there is? And it's like, yeah, that's all there is. Cause that's all you are, dude. Well, you haven't done the work of self-improvement. Exactly. So, this not only applies to job seekers, it applies to HR, and TA professionals themselves. If they would only fix their own employee experience, it would have a positive downstream effect for everybody else. But oh, they wonder, to... why are people so upset about comp, about daycare, about workers' rights? Well, you're upset about these things too. When was the last time you took your PTO recruiter, you know? So these are the conversations I have on punk it, rock HR. It, I love it. And it, and it always, and I urge everyone to check out the show. We'll link it up in the comments and in the notes on the, on the podcast. But it always starts internally when a company complains about the, the candidate experience. I go, look at the inside first. Look at your own employees. These are the people hiring and interviewing. If they're not happy, how's anybody else? How's anyone else going to be happy? I want to go back and I want I want to riff a little bit on on what you were talking about earlier, 
uh, employee candidate experience during the pandemic. And I think this is where there's a lot of and, and, and what's happening as far as the, the talent pool and everything. So there's a few things that are happening that I'm observing. There's okay. a lot of companies out there that are expanding globally. I mean, nationally, right? They can now hire anywhere else. Yeah. So that's mixing things up. And the biggest thing, too, is now they're, they're putting out these broad statements like we're never going to return back to an office. Like we're never, and, and I think personally, and there's a lot of count, I think that's bullshit. I personally believe that humans want to work together. They want to collaborate. They want to be able to go to an office and get the hell out of their house and away from their families and have that separation and have the work friends. But what they also want is the trust and the option. They want the flexibility to say, you know what? The, the numbers aren't, I'm just saying hypothetically, the numbers are on the rise in my town. And you know what? I just feel for the next two weeks, I'm going to stay local until it gets back. Or you know what? Today, I got to drop my kid off at school. I got to take him to a doctor's appointment. I got to take him to that. I'm going to work from home today right. and not have to answer that. And I think a lot of companies were positioned to be successful at this pre-pandemic and those that were not for, for many different reasons. And I think it's going to be a giant cluster F in the next eight to 12 months as we get vaccinated and people start coming back together. What's your take? Well, I agree with you 100%. Adam. Sorry for that rant. I usually don't rant on my show. <laughs> but I, I do have to say this. There's a lot of lying out in the marketplace right now because you do have these well-intentioned, future-forward-thinking HR professionals who are like, oh, the future of work is this, and it's hybrid, and it's all that. Then behind their backs, you have CEOs and CFOs with commercial real estate and leases who are like, yeah. you know what? I know the productivity numbers are good, but I don't buy it. And there are people in here who are not pulling their weight. I want everybody back in the office. So that needs to be fixed. It needs to be addressed because what HR is saying and what CEOs and CFOs are saying behind their backs are two different things. I think there's this other thing where working women don't necessarily want to continue working at home because everything is at home. Housework, dishes, children. It never ends. Workers. Totally. They can't get anything done. So I think this idea that the future of work takes place in our home is offensive and in is non-inclusive is what I want. I hundred percent. I, I I couldn't agree more. And I think it's like it's just PR BS where people think that's what you need to say. Yeah, yeah. Like like literally like would any of this change? Like you know I I do see the positive effect. Maybe maybe there's more trust. There's more flexibility. Let's be honest about it. Like people like going to the office. People like being there. People like collaborating. They like getting the hell out of their house. Mm -hmm. But they, they want to have that 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 flexibility. So it's really going to be interesting. And the other piece, too, is and, and this has been really interesting to watch because I see it firsthand is a whole hiring and onboarding process. So if we're yeah. talking about hiring, a lot of people are always like hire character over skill set. And, and it's a very broad statement. And I'm, I'm totally against it because I say hire for aptitude. I say hire oh. for aptitude first. Yeah. Listen, junior level roles you could train, junior levels there too. But if you're if you're hiring a certain level at a certain role, people have to have a certain skill set and ability because Lori, if you are in a company and I'm coming to work for you and we can't sit together and train and understand the culture and the vibe and the flow and the cadence, you want somebody who could come in pretty much right away and get going at because that's going to affect your job too. So these are all the things that people aren't really talking about. No. And what I call that is self-leadership, something that we're going to hire for in the future because you want people who you hire for competence. A work ethic and also resilience. People who can do their job, they can push through if there's something that's broken or they need to solve a problem and they don't need to sit with 15 people in a conference room. They could just do their just job. Going. That, that is individual accountability. That's Autonomy. confidence. Yes, that's the competence of 2021 and beyond that we're looking for. So yeah, I'm with you. I think this lie of hire for character is also one of these things that like we used to say, oh, culture is the most important thing. Sure, this all sounds really great, but if you're hiring for character, not for competence, there is <laughs> there is There's be no company, you're gonna be out of business. <laughs> right. And there is character incompetence. People who show up and can do their job and do it well demonstrate character. So yes. I, it's just such a stupid sound bite. Drives me crazy. It's such a, and I, and I don't want to dwell on the tooling, but I see it all over social media. And I think it's something that people are just doing for the vanity metrics. And I'm like, tell me about your doctor. What kind of character do you want of your doctor or your lawyer? Or the person fixing your car, or the person watching your kid. Like, I'm like, I'm like, all right. Like, it sounds good on paper, but but yeah. let's let's certainly. What's what's another pet peeve of you right now with some of these sound bites? What are these things that are pissing you off? Oh my God, there's a million. Well, beyond I think talking about you know this hybrid work from home kind of stuff, I'm also a little sick and tired of compassion and empathy. Like that's really bugging me because although those were the buzzwords du jour of 2020. 
they didn't really come true. I mean, people were nice. They were like, how are you doing? You know, what's going on with your family? It's okay that your kids are in your Zoom meeting. Right, right. But that's not compassion and empathy. I think when the rubber hits the road, compassion and em empathy are demonstrated in equal pay for equal work or fair pay or a different way of doing performance or like your reward and recognition program. These are like more real ways to manifest compassion and empathy rather than just asking someone how you're doing. I'm not patting anybody on the back for having manners. Yeah, that should be that should be like entry, like the cost the the cost of entry, right? You should have yeah, manners, and, yeah, and, manners. And, and you should care about it. So I want to talk a little bit. Well, let me let me preface this first. What I'm about to say, you're definitely outspoken on social media. I love that's kind of your personality and everything, yeah. but. You know, let's talk about the word divisiveness in, the, in this country. And let me preface it by saying that I am not pro-Trump by any means, very clearly not. So what do you think it's all about? You know, I, I see you wearing your, your your Biden stuff and everything and talking about it. Do you think that HR really needs to stay neutral? No, I don't think HR needs to stay neutral. But I want to take a step back and say that a lot of the divisiveness, I mean, it's historic, it's systemic. It's not new. We, we also laid off all kinds of men back in 2008. And those men have never rejoined the workforce. And we don't talk about that. And we wonder why these men are angry and storm in the Capitol and vote in certain ways. We have really split our society through economic policy. And so now we're about to do that with women. You know, all the women in this economy right now are the ones who are bearing the brunt of job loss. And I just think there's a real reckoning that's not happening around our economy and the money that's being hoarded at the top and not trickling down. So for me, like, yeah, I was passionate about Biden because he was not Trump, but I was really for Andrew Yang. He was my candidate because I believe in universal basic income, direct cash relief. You know, we can do a big corporate tax cut for CEOs. Why can't we do it for the working class in our society? So, yeah, I mean, I think HR professionals need to have a point of view. They need to be educated about the economy. And they also need to know when people are talking nonsense at work and get on top dangerous of that. Dangerous nonsense. Da dangerous nonsense, yes. And Instead of just putting on blinders, which is what HR does. And what's your point of view about talking politics in the workplace? You know, and, and, and like, you know, there's free speech. People should be, yeah. quote unquote, be themselves there too. But when does it become an issue? Well, you know, I wrote about this for ERE and talked to their editor, Vadim Lieberman, about this. And I really feel HR has this cool opportunity to teach people how to truly talk and to truly listen. And if HR could insert itself or bring in experts and talk about and teach how to communicate, we could have a positive effect on the workforce and the world. But instead, we just kind of get mad at people when they talk about politics. Maybe we write them up. Maybe we give them a warning instead of really trying to help bridge that gap. And I just think there's an opportunity where work can actually be a positive impact on someone's personal life in this case. Bring in the experts, teach people how to listen and how to talk about highly stressful, highly volatile topics and bring it down. We could do so much good for the world. And I love it. That's well well said. And and but it's even more of a challenge now because we're not together and everyone's remote and you're doing it over Zoom. And and you know, what are you seeing out there and what are your takes on this kind of remote telecommuting? Everything's over video, everyone's got to always be on. You know, what's your take on it? You know, years ago, before this, I read a book called Can You Hear Me by Dr. Nick Morgan. It's a great book. Dr. Nick Morgan is one of the mentors I have in my life. And he wrote about how virtual communication is really ruining the world and what we can do to overcome it. And one of the things he wrote about was the fact that when you're on a Zoom, your brain can't really tell if this person's in the room, if they're not in the room, distance is off. And automatically, your brain interprets that character on your screen as a threat. And in the book, he makes recommendations on how to structure your working environment so that people can look at you and realize that you're not a threat, that you're actually a friend. But beyond that, he advises that you go slow. You ask a lot of questions like, how did that make you feel? Or what are you thinking? Or what's going on right now? Do you know how many people do that? Nobody. Nobody does that. Instead, what we try to do is take our real world life and just mimic it right on Zoom. And I think it's dangerous. I think it's going to have some real effects on relationships that we're not going to know for a couple of years. So I'm skeptical. I try not to do anything on Zoom or the screen, but here I am doing my book tour virtually. Well, we do it. We do it. We got to do. And it's really interesting. I mean, I tell folks all the time, I get a lot of Zoom invites from, from clients. I'm like, yeah. hey, could, 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 could we just hop on the phone? Could we, could we just talk on the phone? It takes away a lot of unnecessary 
I don't want to say necessary interaction because it is good to connect with people and look at them too. But when you're just focused on the voice, you could focus more on the message. You're not so concerned yes. of what you look like, what your facial expressions are. It's not an interview. You know, we're just talking shop about some, about a piece of business or an action that needs to be taken. It's so interesting that you say that, Adam, because I just heard from someone the other day who said, I always do my podcasts audio only because while body language can be important, I want to hear what they're saying and I don't want to look at their faces. And I thought that's a really interesting distinction because you're right. When you're doing a podcast, you're going for the story, you're going for the words. And when you sometimes host this via a screen where you can see one another, you get focused on what that individual looks like or what their physical facial reactions are. And it becomes a distraction and it can degrade from the storytelling. So I thought it was a counterintuitive take that I kind of liked. And I'm going to see if it's right for my show. I'm going to try it. I think it's worth a try. I don't completely agree with it. And I've done some audio ones before too. And I, I, I do agree from the focus standpoint, but I know for me as a host yeah. and the way I like to do my show and the way I like to engage, I, I need to, I need to see the person it's weird. And I guess it's an individual effort, but I totally respect. And, and I think that's a unique um, yeah. point of view there too. So let's flip the gears. We're going to get into the book a little bit, but before we do, I want to understand your process as a writer. Let's pull back the curtain. I mean, this is what your, this is your second book, correct? Yes. Yeah. So what's your approach when it's like, all right, new book project is here. Where does Lori start? Good question. You know, the first book I wrote was more of an academic self-published book about human resources. And that I had an outline for and just kind of knocked it off. One, two, three, real easy. The second book is really my first big girl book. It's with a big five publisher. And I didn't know where to get started. And so I found a book coach and I asked, how do I get a real contract with a big five publisher? And how do I write a book proposal? And how do I do this? And so I paid for coaching, which is part of my fundamental belief in this world that if you want something, you need to invest in it, including yourself. So this was an this investment year. in me, right? And what I found is that investment was actually a door to a world that I didn't know existed. It's funny how money fixes things, right? So you spend a little bit of money, you get invited to the big girl table and you learn about how the world works. And so I learned about writing a book proposal, negotiating a contract. I got an agent. I did all of that stuff. And I found that what I wrote in my book proposal was about 25% of what really went into the book. And then when I turned in my first draft, I still had work to do. So the process was just like any other job. I dedicated time on my calendar every single day. I did it. I also had to dedicate time to think, which was different for me, you know? So like I had you to- block time on your calendar just for, for thinking, clear for clarity, thinking. nothing else, no meetings, no, per just, I'm gonna go think. I'm, I walked in the woods and I live next to a national or a state park. So I went and walked around on the trails and got to know that park really well and just kind of thought about what I wanted to do. But the important piece here, two pieces, calendaring and ritualizing things, which is what every smart productivity writer tells you to do, right? Whether it's James, James Clear or Seth Godin, you've got to bake this into your operating system. Otherwise, it never gets done. And so I had to, you know, drink that champagne and do that for myself. Right. And it's about being a student of your calendar. And I think that's that's critical. I had Jordan Harbinger on the show a couple of weeks back. He's a top yeah. podcaster. And he said something very similar. He goes, he puts time on for, he'll put time on for nothing. Yeah. For open, open, like, hey, I'm not recording anything now. I'm not doing anything. I'm just having, you know, alone time. And then he's doing his prep time. And I think blocking and tackling is a key piece, especially, I mean, especially for somebody who's like me, who's like crazy OCD and like all over the place. So I really need to have that focus if I'm recruiting, if I'm podcasting, you know, whatever, whatever that piece is. Lori, who is this book for? Who should be picking this up and reading it? Well, I actually wrote this book with a younger version of myself in mind, because I believe had I read this book, I would still be in the world of human resources and I would still, I would be a little bit happier. So I needed this book when I was working in HR and it did not exist. So I wrote this book for a young man or a young woman, you know, uh, late twenties, early thirties, who's really at a point in their career where they're like, oh my gosh, I could go for that next thing. I could leave. I can go back to school. What should I do? But I will tell you the best pieces of feedback I'm getting about this book are from Gen Xers, men mm -hmm. and women who are stuck. And they're like, oh my God, how did I get here? Why did my life turn out this way? I've heard from you know manufacturing executives, chief marketing officers. I heard from a dude who works in finance, who's like, when you write in this book that I need to be more of a slacker, 
you are absolutely right. And I, in the book, write what a slacker is, you know, it's not somebody who doesn't care about work. It's somebody who does their job right first time and then moves on to other things that they want to do. You know, give me someone who works 32 hours a week versus someone who works 80 and complains about it all the time. Yeah. I'll take that person who works 32 hours a week any day. Like, I'll take the, the efficient slacker, the efficient slacker for sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I'm hearing from people of all walks of life who don't necessarily want to quit, but feel stuck. And in that way, I feel like my book accomplished its goal to be of service. I love it. And it's so interesting where people feel stuck in their careers. I think there's a bit of FOMO. There's a bit of what if there's also, I think like, and I think for a lot of people too, where you go from the college years of your life, even if you don't go to college, those, those, those twenties, early stages into the workforce, you're a different person when you get to your mid thirties and you look back like, I don't know if I'm that same person anymore. I've been doing this for 15 years. What the hell am I doing? And then they're scared of what's next. Like I know for me, I transitioned at the age of 35 and pivoted into the world of green. That was scary. Yeah. I did a career change at 35 and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm literally starting a new job at, you know, a, a fraction of the money I was making last time. But I knew, and this was hard, and maybe I didn't know it then as much as I do now, that that was what I needed to do yeah. to take a few steps backwards to take that giant steps forward. That's right. You can make it easier on yourself for those of you who are out there by having a plan, having a financial plan, doing a roadmap that way, so that when you transition into that next new job that may not pay what you're earning, you've been doing the work of cutting back or investing differently or whatever it is you need to do, paying off your old student debt like I did, you know, making sure that you're setting yourself up for success in that new job. But you're right, Adam, so many people are at their wits end and they want to try that next thing and they just can't. They have a mortgage, they have children, they have college. It's life, it's real life. Right, right. I feel trapped you know, by society and, and, and obligations. So you know what you could do? You can learn that lesson from what I did when I was blogging and do it slowly and turn slow. It doesn't even have to be a side hustle. It can be a curiosity. It could be something you experiment with. And when you get a little bit good at it and you think you're ready to make a business plan, then you do it. But you don't have to go from zero to 100 overnight. I, I completely agree. Lori, what's the one key takeaway you want everyone to get from this book? Yeah. I have two, if you don't mind. The first you're allowed is, up to three, but if you want to go with two, we're cool no. with that. Yeah. The first is you fix work by fixing yourself first. That's where it starts. And the second is whatever you do for a living, your work is not your worth. You are a valued human being because of your relationships, because of your contribution, because you were born, because of the people you love and the people who love you. Your job title is just one component of that. So don't over index on that. Look at your whole offering. Look at your whole portfolio. That is your worth. I love it. And what do you what do you still think is the biggest thing that needs to be fixed in the HR world? I think we need to blow up HR and give it back to the workers and to the managers with the rule you can't recreate HR all over again. That's what I think. Oh, that's a big one. We could have a whole separate podcast on that. One of the things I love most about you, Lori, is just how freaking authentic authentic you are. Right. I mean, you're real. You, you see what you, you are, what you what you see, what you get. It's all it's all there. And I think that's really what resonates with so many, so many and why you're so successful and why people are drawn to you. But what does that word mean to you? Authentic? Well, I'm going to tell your uh, audience out there a little super secret that I don't tell a lot of people, but you only have exclusive. To be, right. You only have to be two percent more authentic than the next guy for people to feel like they can really connect with you. Nobody likes an oversharer. Nobody likes to hear your family drama. They don't want to hear that. But if you can just be 2% more you, more comfortable in your own skin than the average person in the room, doors are going to open for you. So just take a risk, you know, just share a little bit of information about yourself, have an opinion, have a point of view, and you will be amazed at this teeny tiny act of bravery how it just makes the world a little bit easier for you. So it doesn't take much for people to feel like they've connected with you. So take a risk, take a chance, do it. That's great advice. And what would you say is your superpower? What is something that you do better than almost anyone on this planet that makes you who you are? I smile. <laughs> my smile is my superpower. I like to smile at people. I assume good intent. A lot of things make me happy and I show it. So it's my smile. That's a fantastic answer. And, you know, I like to end shows on positivity. And over the last year, I can't believe it's been almost a year already. You know, there a lot of people have gone through some real shit, real tragedy, real heartbreak, real loss, real pain and real loss. 
But on the other side of that, there's been so many amazing things, so many, so much positivity, so much growth and silver linings. And I'd love if you could share one personal silver lining and one professional silver lining that you've experienced during the pandemic. Yeah, personally, my brother, who's a little bit younger than I am, very healthy, a marathoner, a triathlete, was diagnosed out of the blue with colon cancer in January of 2020, stage 3B. So what Chadwick Boseman had. And it just kind of came out of nowhere. And we thought, how is he going to survive colon cancer and the pandemic? And he's in remission right now. It's fantastic. We are so grateful for essential workers who showed up every single day, despite the pandemic, to be there for my brother during chemo and radiation. And it has really brought my family together, even though we don't see one another, we're all over America. My family is closer than ever because of this. So there's a real silver lining in adversity for us that way. Thank God. Professionally, I've had to reevaluate my business like everybody else, Adam, I'm no longer on the road, I'm not traveling. And at first I thought, how am I going to do this? My whole identity is wrapped in going out and speaking. But it turns out being home has reconnected me to some values that I have about the way I live, the way I like to run my life, my routines, what I like to say yes to and no to. So I've missed out on compensation opportunities from not being able to travel. But what I've gained here at home has been tremendous. So I'm grateful for it. I love it. Little side question here. You said something interesting and, and something I've been really working on is how to say no. What are what is some high level advice? Because I, I feel like I always have to be a yes person. I feel like I always want to please people. I feel like I need to say yes to every obligation. And it's it's been throwing me off my course. I've noticed it kind of been throwing me off a course a little bit. So what are some of those things where you could kind of evaluate anything and whether it's a yes or no opportunity? I like to say yes to everything too, but I've asked a simple question. Can I think about it? And in asking that question, you know, can you meet? Are you available? Can you do this? Can I have a free copy of your book? (laughs) You know, whatever it is. I'm like, can I think about it? I'll get back to you. Like, I'm going to turn it around within 24 hours. And it's hard to ask that question sometimes, but I'm really holding myself to it. Can I think about it? I love it. And last but not least, you look back on your life and you think about those times where you were down, you were down in the dumps and you questioned life, you questioned relationships, you questioned work, and you had to pull yourself up and really dig down deep and harness that inner tenacity. And on the flip side, Lori, when you're sitting here right now and you're looking back at your life in the last year and the health of your brother and being connected to your family and all those things that you're so grateful for that keep you focused and determined, Lori, what is your compass? What is your North Star in life? Well, it's a big, broad philosophical question, but one thing I remember when things are tough and life looks bad, today is not tomorrow. This this is something I've been taught my whole entire life. Whatever is going on today can look completely different tomorrow. And as long as you live and breathe, you have an opportunity for a do-over tomorrow. Every day is a do-over. And as long as I believe that, I get through things. Um, Yeah. So it's not like a big, broad philosophical answer, but Today is not tomorrow and every day is a do-over. These are things that are baked into my DNA. I love it. Lori, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I want everyone to go out and check out Lori's new book, Betting on You. Where can folks find it? Where could they learn more? Where could they connect? Well, I hope they go into their local independent bookstore and buy it because it's everywhere in America and North America. And uh, we need to support local businesses that way. So you can pick it up curbside, I'm sure, from your local business or on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. And everybody can just go to punkrockhr.com and fall into my ecosystem. There you go, everybody. Lori Ruderman, thank you so much for joining me. Hang tight for a moment here. We'll see if anybody has questions. And everyone joining us today on the podcast, thank you so much for spending 46 minutes and 21, 22, 23 seconds with with Lori and I. Remember, if you like this episode, please share it. Please leave a review, rating. You know how it works. Spread the love. It goes a long way. Remember, take care of each other. Stay six feet apart. Catch us at thepodcast.com and catch us next week for another great episode of The Podcast. Wisdom is forever. But for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.